What's up, everybody? Welcome back into another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. And this one is one I've been waiting to do, waiting almost as long as some of the jurors felt like they were waiting in the YSL RICO trial, the longest trial I can think of. I know there's probably been longer, but we have been waiting to talk about this with some people involved. And who better than Doug Weinstein, one of the lawyers on the case who represented Diamante Kendrick, all the way through, stuck around all the way through until he got to hear the resounding voice of the jury of not guilty verdicts across the board for his client throughout this trial. And he's been gracious enough to come on here, give us an hour of his time to talk through from a lawyer's perspective, right? And we know a lot of the outside noise of this case, maybe there are politics involved, you know, the political and, and policy, public policy things going on in this case that we've talked about a lot. But I really want to dig into what it was like for a lawyer like him, who's a seasoned lawyer used to deal with these judges, because there were two judges in this trial, the state attorney's office, the jury, the public perception and social media in this case, what it was like for a criminal defense lawyer doing their job to handle it in a case like this that has had so much scrutiny, so many eyes on it, so many questions and so many thoughts and feelings that have hit people deep to the core. So Doug, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Thank you for having me on, Peter. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. I watch your show all the time. So uh, I mean, and this is the first for me for being on. Uh, yeah, man, I, I really appreciate that. What's it feel like? I mean, the day after, what's it feel like? Explain to the people what the adrenaline rush and then crash is like. Yeah, that's exactly the right way to put it. Um, it's it's you're anxious while the jury is out for day upon day, you know, day after day, you can't sleep. Um, at least I was anxious. Max was pretty calm. Um, I thought I was going to get all kinds of work done while I was waiting for for the jury to come back because we were on five minutes call. I got nothing done. Then finally, you get the, the notice that, well, that we have a verdict, which it felt like it came out of nowhere, although I guess it shouldn't have felt that way. And um and then the way the judge read it was like, boom, boom, you know, she didn't go count by count. I don't think my client even got fully stood up before she's like, uh, not guilty on all counts or not guilty across the board. I can't remember the words she used. And then on to Mr. Stillwell, I didn't even get a chance to hug him or say anything until she read Mr. Stillwell's. And then, of course, then it really rushed. Then it all rushed in. And then. Uh, maybe I'm crashing a bit today after exactly the adrenaline rush of yesterday. Yeah. And, and when she started with the guilty for Mr. Stillwell, I was like, and then it's like, Ooh, oh, okay, yeah. understandable, right? You can understand. And, and that we're going to talk a lot about the jury and I try to have some kind of structure as we talk through it, but that to me indicates the jury paid attention, took their time and went through the charges and actually tried to look at the evidence and see if it fit any of those charges. They didn't just go not guilty across the board because they didn't like the state attorney or something like that which I appreciated from them. And, you know, I think it even speaks louder to the time they took on this case to come with a really thoughtful verdict. But I thought it was such a well-fought trial by you guys all and gals across the board on the defense team with everything that you had to deal with. I mean, as long as it was, as, as tough as it was, and I want to start out and kind of pick through the job of a lawyer in this case, a defense lawyer in this case, and how you deal with a state attorney's office like this. So I assume you've been doing this for a while. I know I've, I've seen your resume. I've seen your website. Um, so I know you've practiced civil litigation, criminal um, trial work. And, and I think most of what you do now is criminal. So I know you've done this a while. You've tried plenty of cases in different jurisdictions. So it's not just like you only work with this state attorney's office, but what was it like dealing with day after day, this state attorney's office specifically? Well, you know, I... This was my first criminal trial. No. Um, I, uh, yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, you did a, I mean, you did a bang up job for your first criminal trial. Well, thank you. So thank you've you. done, we'll get it, we can get it. What's that? You've done civil trials. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, wait, and, and let's be clear about that. I've done civil bench trials. This is your first jury trial. Nuts. First jury trial, first Stop. criminal trial. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Oh my God, it's going to make event. the conversation so much more fun. Oh, I have so many. Well, let me, let me say this about it. Let me say, let me say this about it. People are like, well, man, you got thrown into the, I'm not answering your original question. We'll get, we, we got off track, man. You know, you got thrown into the deep end and to some extent that's true, but you have to, I think it kind of worked out great because there I am. I'm in a courtroom 
with Bruce Harvey, Brian Steele, Keith Adams, the Matthews, all these fantastic attorneys. So I took it like a like an internship, like a like a training program. I just watched and learned, and it was fantastic, fantastic. Um, working with this DA's office. So I've been doing criminal for a little bit. This is just my first trial. Okay. You know, I've never had really issues with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office before. Um, I've had really no negative issues with them prior to this case. And honestly, in this case, all the prosecutors involved in this case, save one, uh, were, were great to work with. It was only one prosecutor that really caused the difficulty. But when it's the prosecutor, at least I'm just telling you from the outsider's perspective, what it felt like and looked like, um, from my perspective and the experience I have working with different district attorneys, state attorneys, U S attorneys, whatever it may be as a prosecutor, it seemed like, and maybe it was just because that one difficult prosecutor was the boss or the one calling the shots, but it seemed like it was so difficult to get a straight answer, to know what was coming next. It felt like hide the ball and people don't realize like, and again, it's so funny. This is going to be a completely different context. I, I guess I just assumed from watching you and reading your resume that you had done a bunch of these before because you didn't seem to skip a beat or miss a beat in, in dealing with the things that come with a jury trial. And as trial lawyers, we've got to adapt and that's part of it. Right. Yeah. And so, so that yeah. is part of the game, but not like this. It's really not yeah. supposed to be like this. That's not part of adapting. No. That's not part of being a lawyer. Yeah. So what did it feel like when it felt like they just wouldn't tell you what's happening next? You had to guess, you didn't know what to be prepared for. Witnesses would be called back another day. So how do you prepare for what questions you're going to ask? Um, you know, whether they're here now or later, what was that like? The whole thing was really just, I, there's no other word other than, other than awful, um, until it began to get better once Judge Whitaker took over in the summer. Mm -hmm. But for the first year and a half where we have a prosecution team, and I have to say team because it, it came from the leader, but, um, and she was the one that enforced this, but they're exactly like Judge Whitaker said, playing hide the ball giving us discovery months and months and months late. Um, I repeatedly complained to Judge Glanville about this. In Georgia, in Superior Court, we're supposed to have all the discovery 10 days before trial, which would have been December of 2022. And we are getting terabytes of discovery six months into trial, eight months in, into trial. Um, it was ridiculous. And every time I would try to do anything about it or put a stop to it, you know, I would get um, Judge Glanville you know, like a parent that scolds a child, but then never really does anything about it. Um, and that's the situation. And again, like you said, hide the ball, um, not knowing exactly what witnesses, not knowing exactly within that six terabytes of discovery we eventually received, which discovery was going to come up with what witness. It was very difficult to prepare. Um, I've really never seen like, anything like it. Um, in civil, this would have never happened. And as someone relatively new to criminal, to me, it was shocking that in criminal, the standards would be lower than in civil. And then I learned that after Judge Whitaker took over, they're really not lower. It was just under that judge that they were that way. Judge Whitaker put a stop to all of that, by the way. And she she really enforced a system where you're going to tell us all the witnesses you have coming. You're going to, for each witness, say what discovery you're going to use. And our life got a lot better then. Yeah, and I, and I definitely have questions about the change in judge and how, how you felt that as a trial lawyer. But when, when talking about the state attorney's office specifically, did you feel like you couldn't, I know some of the other lawyers said it, and I think you've kind of said it as well, but just to ask the question, did you feel like you just couldn't trust what they were saying to be true, to happen the next day, to happen with a witness, that it is all the discovery, that they will be using this or won't be using that? Did you find it hard just to believe or trust them when they would say that? Well, I, I, I learned, sadly, that really I could never trust the original lead of that prosecution team. She would misrepresent things to the court. She would flat out lie to the court. I mean, that's the only word, unfortunately, you don't want to say that about a fellow member of the bar, but she would just flat out lie to the court. She, and she would, she would obfuscate. She would, it, it was awful that you can't trust your opponent on the other side. Um, because in my experience dealing with prosecutors, the relationship, as someone again coming from civil, the relationship between prosecutors and defense attorneys, for the most part, is almost better than the relationship between civil lit litigants. Um, and again, in my experience, 
Um, so to have this happen with this particular prosecutor, um, it, it was frustrating. I don't, I don't even know all the words. Um, the way she mistreated Brian Steele, the accusations she would make about him, it was just offensive. Yeah, and, and it was just wild to me to see that happen because people may think, you know, lawyers are cutthroat, we're snake oil salesmen, whatever, we ha we're heartless, but we really don't think that way about each other. Like we really, no. most of the time, even if you feel like, you know, you wouldn't be friends with somebody, you don't like somebody personally, you're going to believe what they say, especially in court, especially in front of a judge, especially on the record. So to have somebody that you start to feel that way about, I always say this, I would much rather try a case or go up against a very good lawyer than a very bad lawyer because a very good lawyer you kind of know what to expect it's going to be a battle the the in most cases especially in civil which is most of what i do now if you have a good case you're going to win and it's going to go the way that it should go nine times out of ten and in a criminal case justice is probably going to be served if everybody does things appropriately but when you have to start to deal with a lawyer that's you know a bad lawyer or really a dishonest lawyer that's going to do things underhanded it makes everything more difficult and to me the combination of that lawyer and the first judge is the real reason this case took so long because it, it should have been so much shorter just cutting stuff out. Like you said, if they're giving me a terabyte six months into trial, no shot. Like, I don't understand how no. that would ever be appropriate. No. And, and, and as a matter of fact, one of the times I complained, I think it was about six months in, and I tried to keep the discovery out because of it being tardy or so late. It wasn't just a week late or a day late. It was six months late. Um, Judge Glanville said to me, well, if this would have been a civil trial, I would have kept it out. And I just found that to be a shocking statement to make. Backwards. Because, because my thinking is, well, what you're really saying is if it's about money, then you would have kept it out. But if, since it's about my client's life and the lives of these other defendants, you're going to let it in. And that's, to me, it's the opposite thinking. The standard should be higher. Um, and, and, and once... Once that prosecutor was more or less mostly removed from the case, uh, everything got better because we had a prosecution team that we could trust, that was professional, that was ethical. You could feel the atmosphere in the courtroom change. Actually, I was just talking to a juror for 45 minutes before I got on the phone with you. Cool. And she said she could feel the atmosphere in the courtroom uh, was different. And she used the term that basically there was a heaviness that would, um, would appear when that prosecutor came in in a lightness when she wasn't there. So she can sense wow. it. Wow. That's yeah. I, I want to get to the jurors thoughts too, but I mean that to me, that says everything you need to know about the difference with working with good prosecutors, honest prosecutors, and frankly, whether you would have won or lost, right? It's still just the vibes and the way that it was handled and the way that it was done is different. You're not just saying that because you won. Um, it, you would have felt that way, even if it would have gone the other way that this, other set of prosecutors, it was just different because you could feel that yeah. as you were trying the case and as you were going through the case. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, and from my perspective as an outsider watching it, it's the exact inverse of, of what Judge Glanville is saying, right? Because my, my dad's been a criminal defense lawyer forever. I don't, I don't know if you ever watched any with, with him on I, it. I have. Yeah. yeah. And he, he was a prosecutor. He's a fan favorite. Time. Say that again. I said he's a fan favorite. A hundred percent. He's everybody's. He's my yeah. favorite. Um, yeah. so, so he was a state prosecutor, federal prosecutor, then defense attorney. So number one with that, and I was a state prosecutor before a defense attorney before now 99% civil, but that's where a lot of the camaraderie comes from is we've done it on both sides. We have a lot of friends that either used to be state attorneys, used to be public defenders. Now they're judges. A lot of judges are prosecutors or former public defenders. And so there's that camaraderie there, which it's, it's very strange when you get a situation like you had with the lead prosecutor in this case. And when you come to a judge that would say something like, if it was civil, I'd keep it out because it's criminal. It's not. It's almost like, I don't think you understand. And, and again, he has been a lawyer much longer than I have, more, has more experience than I have. So I don't mean any disrespect, but I don't know a lawyer that would say that, that would say it's a higher standard in civil than criminal. I mean, just look at the burden. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> the, the highest yeah. burden in all the land is criminal. So I don't yeah. understand where he would think that it would be appropriate to allow something into a criminal case late that he wouldn't allow into a civil case. That That is just such a frustrating part to me as a microcosm of what you had to deal with. The holidays are here. And as if there weren't enough to worry about, did you know that there's a heightened risk of data theft and fraud? Hackers know we are all shopping in a hurry during the holidays. So it's easier than ever to hijack your connection, steal personal information like credit card numbers and bank passwords, especially on unsecured public Wi-Fi. 
But here's how we cross online security off our list. Use ExpressVPN. Because I don't know about you, but we're ordering almost all of our Christmas presents online. It's so much easier to have them show up at our door than have to go out and get them. And it's easier to hide them from the kids. And ExpressVPN is so easy to use, it takes just one click. And you can use it on up to eight devices simultaneously. So you can protect you and your whole family on laptops, phones, tablets, and even TVs. It's no wonder ExpressVPN is consistently rated number one on the market by top tech reviewers like CNET and The Verge. Plus, there's never been a better time to stay safe during this holiday season. Because right now, you can use my special link to get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. Just go to expressvpn.com slash L-Y-K to take advantage of this special deal. That's expressvpn.com slash L-Y-K for three months absolutely free. So thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this podcast. Right. And it, it is, it is, it kind of sums it all up. In way. And he, just to be clear, he never actually said the last part of the phrase. He never said, because it's criminal, I'm going to let it in. He just said, if it was civil, I would keep it out. But he did leave, he did let it in. And it was kind of a toxic mix of a prosecutor who would act. And she's going to, of course, if she sees this, she'll say, I'm being unprofessional by saying this, but a prosecutor that behaved in an unprofessional and at times unethical fashion, coupled with a judge that let her run amok in that courtroom and that didn't put any constraints on her. And I think most of my practice has been federal. Um, and I cannot imagine a federal judge putting up with what Judge Glanville put up. I mean, the number of contempt findings, if, if I would have behaved that way in a federal court, I, I just can't even imagine. And I actually think maybe now most other most other superior court judges in Georgia wouldn't put up with that. Yeah. And, and in case people don't know, federal criminal trials go to trial less than state criminal trials for the most part. Um, but I, I also did notice watching your closing argument that you stuck to the podium a lot and then you'd move out to the side and move in federal court. Most, most of the judges down here, they don't let you go outside the podium. You either got to be standing behind there or touching it with your hand or whatever it may be, but it adds a sort of like professionalism to it as well. And I want to get to your closing argument, but we've been talking about the judges a little bit. And with Judge Glanville, to me, as difficult as I think it would have been to deal with prosecutors in this case, or the prosecutor in this case, it would have been more frustrating for me to deal with Judge Glanville. Because it's it's his courtroom that you're in. You have to play by the judge's rules. You want to play by the judge's rules. You want to know what those rules are, but you want there to be rules and you want the rules to be enforced. And that was one of the most frustrating parts of him is he would like go off and be, get like angry, but not like you said, not do anything. So it was like, what, what is the point and what are we really doing here? And he, I think is a lot to blame for the delays and how long this case took. What, what is your feeling on the effect he had on the trial? Well, he is the reason that it took 10 months to get a jury because he is the one that made that decision to bring in. I think it was around 23 or 2,400 prospective jurors, um, never giving us any uh, any clue at any point how many he would bring in. And we got all our all of our jurors from like the first, I want to say the first 400. So all that other time, we could have sat a jury by the end of February, even under the methodology he was using. So we didn't need to bring in all those jurors. So that's, that's another eight months we could have cut out of the case right there. Um, and then just the way that he, now he may have had a lot of other duties he was dealing with. I'm not exactly sure, but we would only get maybe if we were lucky four hours of court time a day, um, five hours max. It was just a very, we would start late. The breaks would go on forever. I know the jurors were frustrated by it. We were frustrated by it. Um, so that is one of the reasons it dragged on. And then I, I filed a motion to expedite things. Um, and by the way, the state also, the way they presented their case in this plotting, we're going to absolutely present every single thing we possibly can think of. And because it's RICO, it's a huge amount. Because of their, their decision to do that and basically hold all of us hostage, um, I filed the motion with the court giving plenty of case law to put the state on a timer. Um, and the judge refused to do it. So he's he is supposed to be running that courtroom. He was not doing it in what I would I would consider an efficient fashion. Um, and yeah, a lot of this is his responsibility. Maybe all of it. Yeah, and you know what's miserable sometimes? Starting at eight a.m., leaving at seven p.m. 
Um, but you know what's more miserable? Having two years of a trial. And you know what else makes people work faster sometimes when they know they've got to show up at 8 a.m. and leave at 7 p.m. every day? And, you know, it's just like certain things that I've seen and I've had judges do in cases where it's like it sucked at the time, but I get it. And we had to get the case done in one week because the jury could only be there for one week. So we worked 12 hour days. It just, it is what it is. Um, yeah. And he just refused to really do anything practical that could work to move the case along. And then anything he would do or threats he would make, as soon as the state would just not do that, there were no repercussions. It's like my son. I've got an eight-year-old. If I tell him, you don't do something, you're going to get in trouble, and he does it, and I don't punish him, guess what? He's going to do it again next time. And, and that's exactly what you had. You had a, you had a judge that would um, facilitate, is the wrong word, enable, enable this behavior from the state and with no repercussions. I mean, at very rarely would there be, when he'd finally like lose his temper at some point, occasionally he would, he would do something. But the other thing was the... Um, his enabling the state to argue after they lost a motion or lost any kind of an issue. And he would just let them argue and argue and argue. And then of course he enables it because he would change his mind. So if you know the judge is gonna change his mind when he rules against you, well, of course you're gonna keep arguing because um, it's working for you. Um, and Judge Whitaker wasn't putting up with that. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. It's just like when we were in law school, sometimes there were timed tests, right? Sometimes there was a certain number of pages or words you could have in an exam and lawyers have to figure out how to do things in the appropriate amount of time or words. That's something we're trained on. That's, that's teaching how to think and speak and act like a lawyer. So objection, response, rebuttal, that's it. And here's my ruling and it's final and it's over. And that's how you keep things moving. And some people think it's unfair. And guess what? Maybe the first one or two times you do it as a lawyer, it's a little jarring, then you get used to it and you realize I got to make my argument right now because we're going to be moving on afterwards. I, there's nothing, I, I can't stand a judge I can't make a decision, number one. Like the judges I love are decisive and confident and competent in what they're going to do. I don't always agree with them, obviously. Sometimes they rule against me plenty, but it's like at least I can respect the fact that you analyzed it, you thought about it, you made your decision, I know how to act now and we move on. So that's number one. But then I also hate endless arguments. Endless arguments are such a waste of time because then I get wrapped up in it, right? It's like, I'm yeah. like, okay, I want, I got something else I can think of that I can argue now because lawyers can do that forever too. And that was yeah. really frustrating to watch. Yeah. And the other thing is when I was asking for these constraints, asking for these limitations, in a way, I was almost hoping I would lose just in the sense that if, if the state would have been, had some constraints to stop them from just going on and on and on, I think it would have made their case tighter um, it would have it would have uh, forced them to be somewhat creative. Um, it actually could constraints breed creativity, and I think they breed quality. If you're going to let me, if you're going to, if, if an appeal, you have, you have these limits on your appeals briefs, right? Mm -hmm. If you can just go on and on forever, it's not going to be tight. It's going to be loose. You're not going to be focused on what you should. And that's, I think, that happened with this jury when they spend a month on some issue that has nothing to do with a single defendant in that courtroom. And the jurors are like, what, what is this about? Why are we here? Yeah. And it's just like appellate judges are human, right? They're going to follow the law. They're going to do their best. You if you were to send in a 500 page appellate brief, they're going to be like, Oh, like there's no way that this is an appropriate argument. That's why you pick your best arguments. And, and that's just yeah. and the cumulative effect very rarely wins because they're like, okay, so the whole trial was unfair for you. It wins sometimes, but just like you're saying, you pick your best arguments, you go forward. And you're right. If you would have forced them to do the keep it simple, stupid strategy, that might've been better for them, right? So you got to be careful what you wish for in certain times. Um, but it went from Judge Glanville to Judge Whitaker. What was that like? Speaking of a cloud being lifted or um, the vibes in the courtroom changing, what did that feel like being in there every single day and you having a, a new teacher come into the classroom? Yeah. Well, you know, I personally got along with Judge Glanville just fine. I wasn't happy with the way he ran the courtroom, but on a personal basis, I had a good relationship with him. I probably don't anymore since I'm the one that got up there and did that motion in court to disqualify him and have him recused. But um, so I had that. But when she came in, it was like, OK, we have got a jurist on the bench who is fair who is clearly a scholar. She did a lot of appellate work before she went on the bench. She knows the law inside and out. She's no nonsense. And she was doing exactly what you're talking about. Objection, answer, you know, here's the ruling. 
And I, I mean, it's all cliche, breath of fresh air, you know, new day. It was, it was wonderful. And did she always rule in my favor? Of course not. But I knew how, however she ruled, it was going to be a considered ruling that was probably going to be right. Um, and what more can I want than a smart, efficient judge? I don't know what more I could want. It was, it was great. Yeah. And there were people that, you know, online thought she was still too prosecution leaning, or maybe now she's too defense leaning or whatever it may be. And, you know, when, when we talk about it, my dad and I, it's like what some people don't understand. And I can understand, especially because in this case, people were her. That's really all we're asking for. And that's why you appreciated her coming in there. Not because she gave you whatever, she, whatever you wanted, but because she was just going to be fair and you knew what you were getting. Yeah. Right. That's all I wanted was fairness. And that's what we got from her. And um, I mean, just, just God bless her. I'm just so grateful that she went in there and I would have said this regardless of the ruling. I know people, and, and people were jumping on me. They're like, why are you here defending judge Whitaker? She's so pro prosecution. I'm like, I don't know what you're looking at. She is not, she is up there and she's being fair. And then they say, well, you said the same thing about judge Glanville. And I guess for a while I did because I bend over backwards to try to sure. see the best in everybody. And it took a while for me to see it. And I'm like, well, that's true. But Really, I don't see what you're talking about. I think Judge Whitaker's being very fair to everybody. Yeah, Glanville to me was just like a weird, like I couldn't understand some of the stuff that he did because like you can call it pro-prosecution and he was at the end of the day because of what you said, you know, enabling kind of their sloppiness. But it was almost like he was angry at them too. And I just, I didn't understand his logic or feel for this case. I've obviously, I've never seen him uh, preside over another case, but I, I just didn't understand it from the jump. And it was more frustration with the way he ran his courtroom almost than being pro prosecution, which I think at the end of the day, letting them do whatever they want kind of, you know, is a pro prosecution feel, but I agree with you. And guess what? As criminal defense attorneys, our clients usually get the generally bad guy rule held against them. And everybody in the courtroom pretty much is like, Oh, look at that criminal over there. Um, with his lawyer sitting next to him. And that, that's just how it is. And we're used to it. We understand it. But one of the cool things about this case, and we're going to get to the public um, interest in it, was that people were noticing and people were, were taking a look at this. Um, but speaking of absolute rock hard evidence that Judge Whitaker was going to be fair, the plea deals. So we come to a point in the case after all this injustice and not a fair level playing field throughout the trial, and we hear that there might be some plea deals being worked out. And eventually we hear some defendants are pleading open to the court. First off, if you haven't done a lot of that, pleading open to the court is a very scary move because you don't know even no matter how much you like a judge or how fair you think a judge is, you never know what she's going to do. And once you see her start handing out things like time served and people getting to go home today, what's your feeling? How close did you guys get? Of course, I'm not asking for any attorney client confidential information, but what was your feeling as a lawyer, right? You're thinking strategy. What's the best move? What can we do? How's this going to help my case? How's it going to hurt it? What were, what were your feelings going on when those conversations were happening and you're seeing these defendants get pretty good deals at the time? So it seemed. Yeah. You know, all the, we had to guess four defense, four to the six defendants pled out mm -hmm. and three of them did it under a negotiated plea, right? So you, 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 they know what they're getting when they go before the judge. Judge doesn't have to do it, but the judge is going to do the negotiated plea. And then you had this situation with Jeffrey Williams where the terms of the of the negotiated plea or the proposed plea were just so onerous that there's no way he could accept it. And the the guts that it took for Jeffrey Williams to go up there and do, we call them a non-negotiated plea in Georgia. Yeah, I guess you use the term open. Yeah, that's how to, we to go up there and yeah, to go up there and do a non-negotiated plea and put all of his trust in Judge Whitaker to give a fair sentence. Um, and you saw, I don't know if you watched it that day, but he kind of hesitated. They had to take a break and come back again because um, uh, uh, that was the, by the way, that was the most tension I've ever seen in a courtroom in 26 years of practicing wow. law. I've never... I've never experienced tension like that before, ever. Even, even the verdict, I, I want to say, didn't feel, it didn't feel like that level of tension uh, and stakes for whatever reason as that day with Jeffrey Williams. Um, because the judge could have said, okay, I'll take your guilty plea and you're going to go to jail for, you know, go to prison for 40 years. Um, 
the, diff, the, the one thing he had going for him is that Judge Whitaker had the state, and this does not normally happen in Georgia. She had the state put the offer like into the record. I, so I that the, Judge Whitaker, yeah, that's that was wild. Yeah. It's, and the judge usually doesn't even want to know about it. Mm -hmm. um, she she had them put it on the record, and I thought that that was, I thought that was a smart move politically because, and she's a smart person. I'm like, okay, this enables her to, even though the state is like, we want a zillion years, yeah, and she's like, okay, fine, now put on the record what you offered him. Oh well, what we offered him was probation. Oh, okay, yeah. so that when she gave, it enabled her to give probation. I think without her catching too much flack for it. Um, and I don't know if that's why she did it, but um, uh, I, I think she's a principled person would have done it anyway, but I thought that was a smart move. Well, yeah, and the, the number one factor with that is how you're talking about all these guys there. Oh, they're so dangerous. We can't let them back out there. They're doing all this to all these people and they're creating a bigger and bigger group, training people to do, it's like, but you were willing to let him go back on the street as long as he did X, Y, or Z. It's like, that yeah. doesn't track for me. That doesn't track for me. And, no. and Judge Whitaker mentioned that when she was sentencing Jeffrey Williams. But from your perspective, right, you're sitting there um, next to your mm -hmm. client. You're seeing this happen. You see the four plea deals. You realize that you're not going to plea, so you're going to continue with the trial. What was that feeling like? How did you think that was going to affect the trial now that, you know, you know allegedly the big fish is gone and the majority of the defendants are gone? Well, there were a couple of things I was worried about. The, the biggest thing I was worried about is even though these four other individuals had pled out, the state was not sure. Well, the state actually had every indication because they, they really wouldn't tell us that they were going to continue to present all of the case against those people that they were going to present even if they were still in, in the case. Co so in other words, I was going to have to get up to speed along with Max Sharp of all of the evidence against Mr. Huey and all of the evidence they would use against wow. Mr. Nichols. And, and we were going to have to, whereas we had other defense attorneys that were prepared to handle that before. Now we were facing all of that. Um, and fortunately for, and so anyway, I was feeling overwhelmed is one way to put it. I'm like, Max, it's just you and I, and we are facing, you know, we're facing a tsunami that we're going to have to deal with. Um, so that was my initial feeling. It didn't come come to fruition. It, it didn't come to pass. But that's what we were looking at. Yeah. Instead, they had to just present relevant evidence, which I know is probably a new thing. But well, you know, it was all relevant because of the RICO conspiracy yeah. charge. They still could have brought in all the Huey stuff. They still could have brought in all the nickel stuff because, as as I was always told, but this is RICO conspiracy, Mr. Weinstein. It all comes in. Um, and so charging RICO conspiracy, by the way, allows you to take, you know, you can drive a truck through the conspirator, co-conspirator statement um, exception to the hearsay rule. And that's what was being done because of this. Yeah, so that, um, it was tough. I, yeah. And I think that would have backfired on them even more because now you hear all these other defendants names that are not your two guys. And it's like, well, we heard another three months of evidence that had nothing to do with our two guys. And, you know, that could have backfired as well. So like you said, the state starting to tighten it up. I'm, you know, it's interesting to think of the what ifs of what it would have been if this state team would have had the the case from the beginning and the trial from the beginning versus, you know, how it was tried for the first year and a half or whatever it was. Um, you've mentioned the other defense attorneys multiple times. Um, Brian Steele, Max Shart, the whole gang, um, some tough SOBs some guys willing to lay it on the line and gals willing to lay it on the line. Uh, they know their stuff. I loved specifically how respectful you all kept it, regardless of how you were being treated by the judge, by a prosecutor, regardless. Um, and I think that if I were to guess, and I have listened to some clips of what the jurors said, that absolutely worked in your favor um, in the verdict at the end of the day, the professionalism and respect, regardless of how you were treated, which is, is real true character, not just when people are being nice to you. But what was it like working with the team? I've done I've done uh, cases with defense lawyers where the team's great. Um, defense lawyers in different firms, right? Because you guys aren't all in the same firm. Yeah. And I've done yeah. some where it's not so great, but you you learn to work together. What was it like working with the other defense lawyers on this case? So you know, all of my experience in the past working with co-defendants um, and their lawyers has been in the context of civil. And I was with Jones Day. I was with like big Amlaw one hundred firms. 
And you get some of these big firms, these big egos all in a room defending a case together, even like in a patent case, which is what I used to do, where for the most part, your interests are all aligned. It would often be quite difficult to work with these other law firms. I mean, there, there were often issues. This team in this case, amazingly cohesive, amazing, honest to God, like we are, you know, a, a baseball team. A football team. We are all pulling in the same direction. And yes, there would be moments where we might have to stand up and object because of what another mm -hmm. uh, this council might say. But we all knew that would happen. And because of the degree of respect, because we we're working together in almost every instance, that was that ne we never had any friction at all in this courtroom. It was amazing. It was amazing. I, I these are my brothers in the criminal defense bar. I, I love them all, and brothers and sisters actually. Their family. The fact that we're we're not together right now is 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 heartbreaking for me. I, I miss them. I miss them all every day. Anyway, great experience. Yeah, and to me, guess what. Uh, the people with the thickest skin are criminal defense lawyers. So if one of them gets up and objects to you, you don't care. You know they're doing your you you want them to do their job for their client, just like they want you to do your job for your client, because that's how yeah. we all think and talk about this stuff. And people listening and, and tuning into the show and, and commenting and chatting are always telling me, like, it is such an interesting thing to hear a lawyer talk about this stuff, win, lose, or draw, because it's like there are different ways to analyze this and look at it. And it's not personal. It shouldn't be about your ego. It shouldn't about be you. You were going home and sleeping on your bed. You're probably not sleeping well, right? Throughout the trial, but you weren't going back to prison. You weren't going back to jail. No. You weren't looking at that and worrying about that. And we realize that as criminal defense lawyers, which is why we fight so hard for our clients and how we have a different perspective on it. Right. And sometimes prosecutors, which is always why, you know, judges that go straight from being prosecutors to judges, I always like to talk to them um, before I support them or vote for them because I'm like, do you understand what it's like to have a client? Like what, what is your thought on whether it's civil or criminal? Like when you just delay, 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 or you're looking at the rules or the letter of the law, it's like, we're dealing with people too. And these are their lives. This is the biggest thing in their life. And you've got to be able to understand how that works and judges that have never had clients before. Sometimes I, I feel that disconnect between them, but obviously from an outsiders, it looked really fun to be a part of it as miserable as the trial was the team aspect of the criminal defense lawyers looked fun to be a part of maybe not the entire time. Cause I want to get to some of the fireworks that happened throughout the trial. Um, from your perspective, what do you think are going to be maybe the, the biggest two or three fireworks memories moments that you remember from this trial? Fireworks. The number one fireworks was certainly, um, holding Brian Steele in contempt for, for, for even mentioning to Judge Glanville that we'd learned of the ex parte. Um, and there were four of us that learned about that ex parte, but Brian Steele was the one that kind of volunteered to broach that with the judge. Um, and so that day, uh, watching what happened, um, watching and watching the 25 members of the Georgia Criminal Defense Bar descend upon that courtroom and Ashley Merchant and all these guys step up um just just a, a fantastic i just like oh my gosh i am i'm so proud to be a member of this bar um so that was i guess number one fireworks day um i guess for me personally my number two kind of fireworks day would be two days later when i had to ask judge glanville to recuse himself and according to the the rules in georgia i actually had to physically present i couldn't just file it I had to physically present the recusal motion to Judge Glanville in the courtroom. Um, and I wanted to do it in the most respectful way possible. And then he, I mean, him not following the rules and my having to call him out and him telling me to tread lightly, um, that would be like a number two. If you Sir, I'd be, I'd be real careful about what you're pleading at this point in time, what you're stating to the court. I just, as a matter of professional responsibility, remember, we haven't nugged out all of the issues involved in that affidavit. And I would be very careful if I were you, because there are, you have some professional responsibility obligations individually and to this court. And so um, I would be, I would just, I would just leave it at that respectfully. I don't want to get into an argument with you about that, but I would just tell you that 
um, tread lightly, okay, in terms of that at this point. I understand, Your Honor, and, and I believe that the certificate uh, of immediate review would be in the interest of the court. I'm not going to do that. I'm not. Would I'm you make not. factual findings regarding? I'm not. I am not at this point in time going to, um, going to, I've denied the motion, okay? And I guess a number three moment for me, aside from verdict, which obviously was a glorious day, number three moment for me, um, which is one that probably doesn't stick out for anybody else, is when Mr. Stevens' tick was called to testify and his testimony and um, his testifying about being 11 years old and getting in some trouble, I guess, in middle school or I don't even know, maybe, maybe sixth grade, whatever grade you're in when you're 11, fifth or sixth grade, and then them tossing him into juvie and him learning about gangs there and basically society throwing him away. And then watching him kind of somehow crawl out of that, come back from that, try to get on with his life and being sucked back in again to this case, um, to have to come in as a witness and relive that part of his life. Just the way society threw people away. And for me, for some reason, um, Tick, Mr. Stevens was emblematic of that. And it was a, a moving thing for me. And I hope people appreciate we need to treat our folks better. Yeah. And that was that was something you highlighted in your closing as well. Um, yeah. I have to go on a side note on Tick, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Kendrick, Mr. Williams, they were trying to avoid the fate of Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens, remember, I'd love you to go back and look at, listen, read his testimony. Remember, look at your notes. At the age of 11, society threw him away. They threw him away. They tossed him in juvie, where he learned about gangs and drugs and everything else. Threw his, threw his life away. And he's trying to get his life in order again. And he's dragged back into this. Yeah, on my list, again, you had ex parte, you had Brian Steele imprisoned, everything that happened after that, the recusal. The beginning of Whitaker felt like some fireworks, right? She's a pretty big personality coming in there, trying to figure out what's this going to be like. Um, little Woody's testimony. Oh yeah. I know people love him. I mean, that was, that was wild. That was, I mean, that was wild. And then the verdict. Yeah. The verdict was a big one too. Yeah. Just how quick it was, how anticlimactic it felt, how it felt like everybody was just like, yep, that's, that's what it should have been. And I was, I was, and again, I've covered a lot of cases and, and we were just talking about, um, this on one of the prior ones. I can't remember what it was where everybody was kind of shocked at a guilty verdict. And I'm like, guys, like, vast majority of these cases end in guilty verdicts. Like let's look back on all the cases we've covered. Right. And we know this in our practices because most of them go that way. Either you take a plea deal or it's a guilty verdict, especially federal court. Right. Um, oh, I, yeah. I won a couple of oh, yeah. federal trials and even I was kind of surprised at the end when we won because you're going against the big, bad federal government. And so it's like, I, I try to explain that to people that it is not normal to get a not guilty verdict, especially when you have the time and resources they spend like they spent on a case like this. It is an embarrassment to that prosecutor's office for going through with this case and presenting it the way that they did. And yes, it's a just verdict. Yes, it's a fair verdict. Yes, I think it was the correct and only verdict based on the evidence presented and the way this case went. But it's not, it still doesn't feel like justice because of what they had to go through throughout it. And I know your client, another client stabbed in prison, picking up or in jail, picking up more charges while in jail. And it's like, so they didn't get to go home after this not guilty verdict because they had been in jail as presumed innocent men and found not guilty by the verdict, but they're still there because of stuff that happens in prison. When you're a dude in there being called a gang member, it's like, this is why, this is why this stuff shouldn't happen like this. And the fireworks in this case to me were really the highlights of the injustices. And, and one of the, the ways they were highlighted was with your closing argument. And this is part of the conversation I'm, I'm really interested in now to hear that this is your first jury trial. What did you feel from the jury while you're in the courtroom, all these months and months, hours a day with them, leaving for breaks, coming back and seeing them again? Were you picking up any vibes or any body language or any expressions from the jury throughout the trial? You know, um, it's interesting. The jury was pretty stoic throughout the trial. They did not give a lot of visual cues um mo the only cues i could really get from them is i could tell were they paying attention or not and were they taking notes or not those were basically the only two variables i had to work with um 
That and when they occasionally, for example, Juror 56, who came back a few weeks ago and said, look, you know, I, I, I want to get on with my life. This is this is crazy. Um, and to later kind of figure out, I think he may have been speaking for the whole jury. So the jury was clearly frustrated with the length of the case. And that is, by the way, and the reason I mentioned that, that's one of the reasons that I made my closing so short. I think my closing was 45 minutes. Um, I was able to make it 45 minutes because Max Sharp went first. And so there's a lot of things he covered that I didn't have to. Um, but even so, I was going to streamline it. I thought they would really appreciate me being efficient with their time and respectful of their time because honestly, the state had not been. Yeah. And I have had trials where I can see jurors rolling their eyes or, you know, being like, again, we're doing this again or whatever it may be while a witness is on the stand. And after hearing what some of the jurors have to say afterwards, and even some of the alternate jurors, I would have expected that. Um, I would have expected you to see that in the courtroom, but you're saying you didn't see a lot of that on their faces during the trial, even when there were moments where the prosecution was just having witnesses up there for days. Yeah. And I'll tell I, I only learned today when I was speaking to that juror for 45 minutes, why that was apparently a deputy went up to the jurors toward the beginning of trial and said, you guys are kind of making facial expressions and wow. you're doing this. He goes, he goes, you guys, this is a professional setting. You need to try to be uh, stoic about, about these things and not do that, which kind of struck me as odd that a deputy would say that to them, but that's, they were having to consciously not provide reactions. Yeah. I mean, I do think that's borderline inappropriate. I don't think he's wrong, but I think if he's going to say that you better know it, um, if the deputy right, is exactly. the jury, then Doug Weinstein should know that like that's that, I mean, that, that doesn't surprise me at all, but it, people don't understand the effect that can have on jurors too. Right. Like they can feel yeah. like they're being reprimanded and, you know, frankly, some emotion is not always bad. Right. And, and that's, that's a whole different. Yeah. And they, and they, to some degree, they weren't affecting anybody. It was just themselves. Right. And it's denying us feedback on how we are doing in front of the jury. Um, but I don't want to make a big thing about it, but that's apparently why they were so stoic. And yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. And and one of the reasons I asked is because I have a bit of a sarcastic attitude sometimes, you know, with my friends and whatever. And I try not to do a lot of that in the courtroom, especially in closing arguments. I, I have in certain cases because you get a feel for a case as a lawyer, you get a feel for a jury sometimes. And your closing argument to me struck me as you had a feel for this case to attack it in a certain way. And the way you attacked it from my perspective, right? For me watching it as, you know, a, a juror on the outside, you were like, this is an abomination. This is horrible. You were a bit angry, a bit sarcastic. Um, you brought some levity to it, but the levity was, was like a shocking levity. Like this shouldn't be funny, but this is how I feel. They're all wearing red today. Are they a gang? It's like, come on, what are we doing? You know? And from my perspective, the way you brought um, some sarcasm and anger to your closing argument made it stick with this is really a gang now. This is what we're going to call a gang. We're all in a gang then. And from my perspective, I think that would have stuck with the jury, especially because you want them to look at it as a case that the state did not present the evidence well. They didn't present it in a, in a, in a way that was digestible by the jury where they could look at it and say, okay, check this box, check this box, check this box, guilty. And the way you did it to me would turn off a jury that hated you. Like if that jury was sitting there and they don't like Doug Weinstein, they'd be like, this jerk is so sarcastic. We got victims' families over there and we're looking for justice here. But if they're with you and they like you and they hate the state, it's a home run. So what was your feeling giving that closing argument? What, what kind of thoughts were going through your head preparing it and as you were giving it? You know, it's interesting you say that because I thought, and I guess I did read the jury a little bit more than I appreciate. You had to if you gave that it. closing, I'm just telling you. More, yeah. than, more than I appreciate it. The jury clearly turned against the prosecution during the course of this case. There were several jurors that clearly infatuated may have been too strong a word, but they really seemed to like Miss Love at the beginning. And I could see that turn as this case progressed. So I definitely had the sense that they, they turned against the prosecution. I definitely, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to pump myself up, but they, they seem to like me. Like when I would have a little bit of levity during cross, yeah. um, when I would 
allow the witnesses to display their humanity, I could see the jury really appreciated that. Um, and um, even when I would be nervous at times starting across, which I clearly displayed at times because I, again, not crossed much before a jury, they almost seemed to be supportive of me. You know, okay, there's a real human being up there. Literally, so I did think the jury... That is the What's best that? feeling and thing you can have from a jury. If that's a feeling you got from that jury, they're yeah. not, not in the palm of your hand. Like that's not, I don't like that, that no. phrase. They're standing next to you and they're like, come yeah. on, man, Doug, ask the question, man. We're with you. It's like, we agree yeah. that. Why is yeah. it happening like that? Why, why is the evidence being presented like yeah. that? Gang expert? Come on. Yeah. This guy's a gang yeah. expert. And he can read people's minds. I, I, and I, and I, I'm a little sad you said sarcastic. I didn't want to be sarcastic, but I did I want to. I didn't mean it as offense. I didn't mean it as no, no. offense. I, I, I did want to, but I did, you, and, but you also mentioned some humor. So I guess if you combine that together, you get some of the stuff I was trying to do, which was mockery. Um, yeah, okay. I did want, That's I, perfect. Perfect. I did, I did want to mock some of their positions because, honestly, if you sat here through this whole trial, the things they put up as evidence merited mockery, demanded mockery, that you're going to hold people's lyrics against them, that you're going to hold the way they're dressed, that you're going to hold the fact that my client's out there doing a clothing advertisement. Um, it just, it demanded mockery because their case was absurd. Um, some of the things that they used as evidence. Um, and I just couldn't believe my luck when they strolled in, strolled, I don't want to say that, when they came in, um, on the closing day, and they were all in red. Um, all the women had red from head to toe, um, and the men had on the red ties. And I, I was like, I can't, this must be a setup. They're waiting for me, because of course they go last, right? They're waiting for me to say something about them being dressed all in the same color, because they're just, so I was hesitant, but I'm like, I can't help it. I just can't, maybe they're setting me up, but I've got to say something about them all um, being in red today. Um, and then my co-counsel, Katie Hingerty came in and read, okay. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to work that in somehow. <laughs> oh, well, wait, they are a gang because look at these pictures of YSL wearing green clothing. That must mean they're a gang. You guys are mostly in blue and black. You associate with each other here today. Are you guys a gang? The state is all in red today. Are they a gang because they're all dressed in red? Poor Miss Hingerty happened to come in red today. I guess she's a member of the gang as well. It is absurd. Um, but I tried to be flexible. I, I certainly, my original closing was probably two or three hours. I worked for days to try to hone it down to under an hour. People in the office worked here with me going through it. So I got feedback from them. There's stuff I didn't use because they're like, eh, that's a little too much. Um, but I think I had a good feel for the jury and they seemed, well, they did, they, they did say they enjoyed my closing and they enjoyed, um, the mixture of seriousness, a little bit of slight humor. Um, so it, it worked and I'm, I'm really glad. So here's what I'll say. Mockery is definitely a better word than sarcasm. We'll start with that. Um, and so, so you don't have to puff yourself up, but I, I will say a couple things from my perspective that. What's cool about the defense team too is you guys have different personalities from my perspective, different styles. And you stuck out probably as the nicest, right? You came off as kind of like the nicest presence to me, just, just to me. Um, I'm not saying one is better than the other or anything like that. So I think you having that disposition throughout the trial, coming out and saying things like the state's a gang or this law enforcement guy is the last one that's seen with a $500,000 watch. And, you know, are we going to accuse him? Maybe I should indict him. Like, that's the kind of mockery, sarcasm, whatever it is that I think is like, whoa, yeah, what are we doing here? Like, a jury's thinking like, yeah, what are we doing here? And whether you felt it at the beginning of your closing that you were vibing with the jury or the jury was, was with you, you definitely seemed like you got there and were feeling it throughout the closing. And I feel like the, the points really flowed. They made sense. It was easy to listen to, which is what you want as a criminal defense lawyer, as any lawyer giving a closing argument. And going from three hours to 45 minutes is the biggest fear of most lawyers because closing arguments is our time to shine. Get out of our way. 
We're going to explain to you how we see the evidence. We're going to put it together point by point. Nobody can stop us. And so sometimes we want to go for three hours and it would have lost its luster in my opinion, if it would have gone for three hours, I'll just, I will bet on that. Right. It still could have yeah. been great, but I think the shortened version was probably the best version. And from my perspective, closing arguments is not going to convince the jury. For the most part, the research shows that closing arguments are going to give the jurors that are already with you the ammunition they need back there while you're arguing to say, no, if you're saying that, then guess what? We need to uh, convict the prosecutor's team. If you're saying that's all it takes to be a gang, well, that gang expert's part of a gang. And you gave them the ammunition they needed to go back there and show how truly mind-blowing some of the arguments and some of the evidence the state presented was. And that's why that's why I would say very job, job very well done on that point when it comes to closing arguments, from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I really do. Because obviously Absolutely. this is the first time I've done that in front of a jury. I love um, it. So... Um, but yeah, I think if I'd have been a jerk kind of throughout the thing, I couldn't have said the things. Right. But you know, but, but you know, Mr. Botts, David Botts, the older gentleman that works with Max Sharp, who's been a criminal defense attorney forever and ever, what he gave me some advice. He's like, don't don't listen to what other people say you're supposed to do in your closing. You have to be yourself. Hundred um, percent. You have to absolutely be yourself. And who myself is, I I try to be a nice guy. I try to. I try to be friendly. I try to again bring out humanity uh, in but it's witnesses. Not soft weak. No, no, I don't think I don't think it's that's not. it. That in the closing um, argument showed it. Yeah, um, and I and you know hopefully it was effective. I mean we got we got the verdict cool. that we should we we should have had. So I didn't screw it up at least. Yeah, that's true. Just get out of the <laughs> way sometimes, right? Yeah, so the last thing yeah. I want to talk about real quick is social media and and just the public looking at this case. Um, obviously you noticed it. I, I think a lot of the lawyers noticed it. Um, you interacted with it on, on Twitter and, and other things. And, um, did that affect your strategy, your confidence level? Um, knowing that people who don't know who you are, some of them fans of, of some of the defendants, but like myself, I don't, I don't know if I've heard a single one of the songs by any of the defendants, but seeing the case the same way you did as an injustice. Um, I always say like the people that watch uh, my channel that are in the chat, the chat, you know, we call them, they are a cross section of society that can be jurors in the jurisdiction that they're in. They are a focus group. The way they see things is usually the way a jury sees things. What kind of confidence did that give you knowing that seeing that and did it affect your strategy at all? You know, it's, it's a great point because we were watching the chats throughout the trial on various streams mm -hmm. and they were all, for the most part, very positive to what we were doing in the defense. And, and I was hoping to get insights into exactly insights into the jury by watching those chats, by interacting on social media. But by the same token, I was telling myself, these are basically fans, a lot of them. So I'm going to have to take it with a grain of salt. I don't know that that's necessarily representative of my jury pool. But then, so anyway, yeah, so I, I, I I use that as feedback throughout the trial, but, but taking it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. um, I was cautious about it. because I don't want to drink my own Kool-Aid. And that's kind of what you could end up doing, I think, in this situation. Um, so I, I, I took it, but I was cautious. And, what's, and it did form a lot of what I did in the closing. Um, and then it was so funny talking to the jury afterwards was they were pretty much aligned with the thoughts that were coming through on that chat. That chat was representative of what the jurors were thinking at various times throughout this trial. And that um, that surprised me in a pleasant way, I guess. I, I was pleasantly surprised by that. I wasn't wholly unexpected, but I was like, okay, I guess maybe I could have taken it uh, without the grain of salt. You know, it, it seems to be an accurate reflection of what the jury was thinking. Most trial lawyers are... I don't know if pessimistic is the right word, but getting overly confident in trial is never a good thing, never a smart thing. So regardless of what, yeah. what you read or hear, you're always going to like, you know, keep yourself grounded. And I think that's smart, but I will tell you, people think I blow smoke when I talk about the chat. Um, they have a better read and feel on most jurors than I do. I'll explain the process. I'll say I have a better read on what the lawyers are thinking and what the lawyers are doing and preparing, but they're like, oh, that witness was stupid. They were clearly lying, saying things I would never say about a witness, but guess what? Most of the time, if we hear juror interviews afterwards, it echoes so many of the same sentiments as the chat and the people watching this right now. And I think as a trial lawyer, 
And as a lawyer talking to other lawyers who are handling high profile cases and trying cases, it is foolish to not use that as a resource, to not use social media where the public has access to you to tell you what they think about a case. If your trial is being streamed and the, the witnesses that a jury is looking and testing their credibility and determining whether or not what they're saying is true. And you have a hundred thousand people giving you their opinions. Now, of course, some people are wild on both sides and whatever it may be, but you can usually get some kind of consensus, learn from it, take it as a piece, as a, as a part of the data. It does not have to be everything, but exactly like you said, it can form parts of how you attack a case. And especially with your closing argument, realizing how so many people are with you and are like, that's wild. I could never believe that. How is X, Y, and Z even real evidence? And then you use that for the jury and it works. Yeah. I mean, I, I will absolutely tell you that it is a fact that certain questions that I used in cross-examination were used. They weren't written out ahead of time. They were used because of things that I saw in the chat. Some of them were questions that came up in the chat. So, And, and oftentimes I would go toward the end of cross-exam after some others had done cross-examination. And I'd, I'd say, well, okay, some of the people in the chat seem, would still seem a little confused about these issues. So let me go in there on, when it's my turn for cross-exam and clarify these things. So I'm not going to have the benefit of having all my trials streamed. Definitely but not. It, it, it's a huge tool, um, not just in the chat, but, but Twitter feedback I would get. Because um, I was pretty active on Twitter. I only did TikTok more recently. But pretty active on Twitter and, and going on shows and seeing the questions that come up. I used, look, first criminal trial, I'm going to use absolutely everything that I can, um, yeah. that's, everything I can. That's really wild. That real time you're using the live. That's the first time. Real I've time. Heard. Yeah. I've real talked to people that have been handling, you know, other cases that have been live streamed and have had, you know, a lot of uh, public interest. And I have not heard that, that, I mean, that is, that's like having a juror sitting there listening, knowing only what they know from the trial, right? Because they're not supposed to know everything about it when they come in and being like, gosh, I don't, I don't, what was that third car? What, 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 what was that Instagram thing supposed to, what were they trying to prove with that? Or why is the defense attorney focusing on this so much and then being able to go follow up and clarify. And you also had the benefit of multiple defense attorneys going and crossing before you and having that time to even, you know, chew on it a little bit more. I mean, I gotta be honest, Doug, I hate to tell you, um, this experience as your first criminal trial, probably not going to help you a ton in your next one. It's probably going to be very different, right? No, I mean, this is, no, this it is. be more different than every criminal trial I've ever seen. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 um, in a way I had training wheels right throughout this trial. Yeah. Cause if I miss an objection, well, somebody else is going to object. You know, if I, if I miss something on cross, someone else is going to pick it up. So, um, I, I take issue with people that say I was thrown in the deep end. Maybe I was thrown in the deep end, but I was thrown in the deep end with like some of the most phenomenal lawyers ever there to back me up on everything. Yeah, most people don't like pressure. And this trial definitely was a lot of pressure. So from that perspective, that was the deep end. You dealt with the pressure cooker. And there's probably not going to be another trial where you feel quite the amount of pressure you did this one because your client's life's always going to be in your hand. Um, but uh, at this point, you had the whole world watching at the same time. And so many frustrating things happened to you throughout this case. So as a lawyer, not even a defense lawyer, prosecutors, lawyers, civil lawyers, criminal defense lawyers, I really appreciate what you did, what your whole team did. You. Um, it was frustrating to watch, but also, like you said before, a breath of fresh air to see people willing to to fight, even when we know how people think about defense lawyers sometimes. Um, and it was really nice to see the system at least work at the end, the jury system work to see the injustice and come down with a not guilty verdict on a case that the, the state just didn't even come close to proving, in my opinion. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me about the case. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for having me on. I, I also, it. I didn't know you were on TikTok. I'm not really active on TikTok, but what I am going to do is I'm going to put all your links in the description below, your Twitter, your TikTok, things like that. So people can right. interact with you on there. I'm sure there's going to be tons of questions um, and, and maybe we'll do a follow-up sometime, but uh, thanks again, Doug. And I wish you nothing but the best, you and your client. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. 
And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know. <laughs>